So this week's Torah portion is the portion of Kairach, which relates the tremendous upheaval that was caused by one person in particular, and then a group that he created of people that decided that they wanted to overthrow the leadership that God had created, not because they in particular um, had a plan exactly how it would all be done differently, but more out of an internal drive that they themselves should not have been excluded from the leadership. And the ironic thing is, and this is the, 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 the tragic part was that uh, the Kairach and the people that went with him, they were 250 people all conveying, con, uh, all vying for one position. So there was a contradiction in their revolution. They were seeking that everyone should be equal. On the other hand, it wasn't really possible for everyone to be equal because they were all vying for the position of authority to be the one person who would be the high priest. So they were contradicting themselves in their own thinking. And that's what we have to be cognizant of is to what degree do we, are we contradicting ourselves in our own thinking that we are, or when we're, especially when we're listening to other people, they'll come to us and they'll try to sell us a story and then we could adopt their thinking, come and try to sell us a story by saying, listen, everyone should be on the same level. Everyone should be equal, but they should be in charge of all these equal people. And it, therefore, in order to create equality, create everyone equal, everyone has to do this A, B, and C, um, and then they will enforce that on everybody, but they will become the enforcers. They will become the one who is in charge, but there's only one person that could be in charge. So this is the this is the paradox of what Korach was trying to prompt this revolution, but really, while he came and appealed to the his audience with the seductive concepts of equality and everyone will be the same, everyone will have, everyone should be this this leadership should be why you why not everybody? But yet he was hoping that out of the two hundred fifty people, he was going to be the one that would have been selected. And I I I, I wonder. When we think about this, what would have happened if um, somehow one of the other 250 people had been selected as the leader? I mean, we see that God Almighty ratified uh, Moses's um, appointment of Aaron, his brother, as the high priest. But there was this contradiction built into the revolutionary idea of tearing down the power structure creating allegedly a more equitable leadership where everyone could vie for this position, but in tearing down the existing authority structure in the end was only gonna be reinstituted a single person in charge. And it was really a trick. It's really a lie. It's really a trick because the we see that God Almighty put his trust, his leadership into Moshe Rabbeinu because Moshe Rabbeinu was a person who was dedicated not for his own advancement, was dedicated for the well-being of other people. So he, for example, uh, not only of other people, of, of all of creation. So it says that Moses was a shepherd after he fled Egypt spent 40 years in Midian, and he was a shepherd there. And the Torah relates the concepts of his kindness to the animal chasing, caring for every single animal, running after an animal that was a, was a stray sheep to take care of it, make sure what it had, it had all its needs taken care of. We see a similar um, example by King David. And it was for that characteristics, that ability to care about every single living thing and all of creation that then made him fit to be promoted to be able to care for the Jewish people and to, for all of humanity by being the one selected to lead the Jewish people out of Egypt and prov provide an example to all of humanity of how to be freed from physical slavery through by first being freed from spiritual slavery. 
and then to go to Mount Sinai and bring the Torah down into the world, that it should be the message and the light for all the nations of the world. So this is the trust and the, the example that Moses was selected to be the one to lead the Jewish people. So comes along somebody and he decides that he's going to, he wasn't, he wasn't, doesn't say that he was going around making sure everyone had what they need, but he was going around telling people, spinning their heads with the idea that they somehow needed to have this position themselves. And therefore it was inequitable that only one person, Moses was the leader. And not only was he the leader, but he had appointed his brother to be the high priest. And this was an injustice because the power wasn't being shared more equitably. And in Karach's mind, the only equitable solution was to have himself as the person in power. But in to do that, he had to first convince everyone else because he would look kind of silly, just him coming in and squawking about how he wants to be in charge. So instead he got a whole crowd to um, of, of very important people to join his cause and everyone to clamor that they all wanted this equality. But his real motivation was that he would be the one who would be more equal than everybody else. And so we have to be on, aware of and be on guard for this type of thinking that comes to us. And we people stand up and they're going to tell us that equality is everyone's going to be equal. Everyone's going to, everything's going to be fantastic. And this is how it happened in, in history. We see by the Russian revolution, they come and convince the people, why should the czar be in charge? Why shouldn't everyone be in charge? The workers should be in charge. All the workers are going to be in charge except the person that convinced the workers that the workers should be in charge, then became in charge of all the workers after he deposed and assassinated the, the czar. And that's what happens in country after country, and place after place. And the same revolutionary concept goes through from generation to generation and until our very times in the very countries that we live in, that this is the concept, the, the, the power is diffused among the multitudes of people that don't really have any ability to perceive and differentiate between good and bad, and what's good and bad for themselves and what's good and bad for them, for the, for the country as a whole. But by diffusing the power, then it means that good people are diffused out of the leadership. And then the people who promoted the idea of the very diffuse equality are then the ones who seize power to then impose on everybody and enforce the quality where everyone will be equal, but for them who will be more equal than others. And so this is this is what the Torah is teaching us, that this is this is a concept of, of tremendous darkness. And God Almighty showed not only that Moses was correct, but in addition, then the earth opened up and swallowed the families, not only the Korach and his followers, but their entire families and all their belongings were swallowed into the earth. Um, because it's such a, it's an unstoppable thirst. It's an unstoppable, unstoppable quest to, to revolutionize, so to speak. And the only way out of it is to eliminate that because once a person becomes so imbued in it, it becomes something that's very challenging to return from. However, we see that the children of Kerach and the grandchildren of Kerach, they themselves did shuva, and many of them became um, great people later on. So it is possible. It's, it's never, never completely lost. No matter how twisted a person's thinking comes, becomes, it is always possible to return to God Almighty and to be able to serve God. I also want to mention that this week's uh, the eve of a very special day, which is Gimel Tammuz. Gimel Tammuz is the time when Yeshua, the successor to Moses, was um, Joshua when he came to the land of Israel. And in the battle, he was stopped the sun from setting so that the Jewish people should be able to complete the battle. And he was successful in pausing the sun setting, was on Gimel Tammuz. And also, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was someone who had defied the revolution in Russia. We were just speaking about the revolutionary idea that disconnected 
the population from God Almighty. He defied that disconnect and insisted on continuing to connect people to the source of life, which is God Almighty, and to recognize that there's a higher authority. Because in reality, the war, when we talked before with the war of equality, the war of equality is not directed at, at humanity alone. It's directed at God. It's directed at saying that these people have decided they'll take over and, and replace God as the authority over humanity. And this is what exactly communism is about. And that's exactly what happened in Russia and in all the other places that it has and spreads to. And the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Yossi Yitzhak Schneerson, he took upon himself to defy that in every way because he recognized that his responsibility was to continue to connect Jewish people and humanity to their creator. And even in the face of the most terrifying and greatest darkness possible of communism, he was able to inspire his followers, even though they were a minority among the Jewish people who many, unfortunately, and the majority had made compromises unwittingly and fallen into the trap of the of the um, persuasions of the communists to accept secular education into their schools and accept the the revolution, thinking that it was somehow going to be better for people because it promised equality and promised all kinds of relief from what appeared to be the inequalities of the previous regime, and yet uh, they fell into that trap. And within a short period of time, they they were completely prevented from observing Judaism and connecting to God Almighty. But the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, with great, great personal self-sacrifice and the self-sacrifice of his followers, continued without any hesitation whatsoever to continue the survival of Judaism in Russia. And as a result, he was arrested in 1927 and had a, a sentence, was sentenced to the uh, most severe sentence possible. And uh, he still, nevertheless, completely defied the authorities in the prison, refused to comply with their rules because he recognized that they were coming from this concept of a mullik that wants to rebel against God. And when someone who's rebelling against God wants something even minor, seemingly minor, like stand or sit at a particular time, then it is a time in which a person is meant to give up his life because that sitting and standing is meant to deny the authority of God and to accept the authority of Amalek. So he defied them with great zest. And um, as a result, they eventually capitulated miraculously to relieving him, uh, releasing him from prison on Gimel Tammuz and to send them into exile, which is exile was uh, only um, nine days later was commuted to um, being um, expelled from Russia instead of staying in exile in Russia. He was uh, ejected from the country. So this is what happened in Gimel Thomas. And also Gimel Thomas is the, the um, date that the, the Rabbi Menachem and the Lubav, of uh, Schneerson of Lubavitch, this time when the, uh, we, the last time that we were able to um, be able to learn from him in this world that these this uh, teachings of the Lubavitch Rebbe are the, the teachings of the generation to t guide us and how to bring the world to the complete redemption. How are we meant to activate in ourselves and in every single human being the desire for the world's redemption that Mashiach should come and that there should be a revelation of godliness in the world? How are we meant to um, trigger in ourselves the, the, the scream and the desire that we want things to be different than they are and the willingness to be so dev devastated, like we've learned in the Mimer, we've, we've learned in the Gate of Oneness, that the, so devastated by the way things are that we, are, will, we cannot rest, we cannot stop until every single human being is completely conscious of and aware of the oneness of God and aware of God's love for them and God's creating them at every instant and God taking care of them at every instant and aware of God's abundance that we're not able to tolerate the concept that there's a person who's unaware of that or limited in his awareness of that, that's unbearable for us to, to know that, that there's someone in the world who's suffering from less than a 100% 
awareness and consciousness of that. And by the fair virtue of the fact that that person is lacking in their complete consciousness and awareness of godliness, that means I too and am, am lacking because if there was, if I was, if that person is limited, that means there's a limited revelation of godliness in the world, which means I'm only experiencing a limited revelation of godliness. So I can't fool myself into thinking that, oh, I, I think I got things figured out and I'm okay, even though that guy's not okay. If he's not okay, if he's suffering, it means that I'm also suffering because I don't have the whole picture either. I don't see the things as they really are because there's only a limited revelation of godliness in the world. So this is the drive that the Lubavitcher Rebbe implanted in us, to the, which is really the drive of Avraham Avinu, which is Abraham. And the drive of, of humanity since the beginning of creation is that we should not get distracted by the temporary difficulties, not get distracted by the immediate things that come to appeal to us, but rather recognize that the greatest thing that we can accomplish and the only thing that we're meant to accomplish is a connection to godliness and we'll have everything that we need. So this is the, the teachings of his life and the teachings that continue to actively inform us and, and, and uh, inspire us and drive us to recognize in ourselves how we can be more um, aware and, and awake and driven by this idea and also to bring that to the rest of humanity so that they themselves will want exactly what we want, which is that they will want that everyone should be connected to God Almighty. So this is the lesson of Gimel Tammuz that, that, that we really we, we are able to transcend, just like starting with the story of Joshua, we're able to um, transcend the natural order of the world, that he was able to stop the sun we're not bound by the natural order of the world. And just like the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was able to overcome the communists and, and cause Judaism to survive and even thrive in many ways underground in Russia against all the technology and all the spies of the, of the Soviets, um, that it's entirely possible. We're not limited by the physical world. And that's the lesson the Torah comes to tell us. And when we have that front and center, then we're able to completely transcend what appear to be obstacles, what appear to be the attempts of others to reshape the world into their own image, claiming that it's all for our own benefit. We realize just like Korach, it's not for our benefit. It, they're telling us it's our, for our benefit so that we'll gather together and lend a hand in their revolution. But in reality, it's for their benefit in their war against God. And God Almighty is gifting us with the ability and each one of us with the ability to see things as they really are and to see clearly and to be able to make a choice on which side do we stand. Do we stand with the, the secure people, the people who believe in God Almighty and are not affected and not influenced by any threats and any fears? Or God forbid, are we going to align our thinking with the insecure people who fear lack and who fear scarcity and use fear to drive mankind into be remolded into submission into their model. So we, we do always have a choice. And even if we made a mistake until now, we have a choice to turn that around and we will be able with God's help because this is God's vision for each person, all of humanity. Even if we think it's a small number now that see this, it's really, God's Almighty's vision that all 8 billion people are going to see this. Like we learned in the gate of oneness that every human being needs to know that, that they are created in God's image and exactly how it works and that everything they're experiencing from the beginning to the end is 100% only an experience of godliness. So uh, we have a question over here. And the answer to the question is that we are, um, when we say is the idea of the feeling the suffering of others is unbearable, then the same idea is being, is, is, is it the same idea is being used to attempt to push others into compliance with different mandates and so forth. And the answer is no, there's a complete difference because first of all, when I'm recognizing my, that the other person is lacking, I want to inspire the other person but it's, there's no compulsion whatsoever. No compulsion on me. And there's, I'm not compelling the other person. The compellingness of 
of truth is that a person, when they see the truth, they are inspired and motivated to, um, to, to cleave to it themselves and to increase in that. They're not, they don't need, you don't need any, any form of compulsion to be able to, to get a person inspired because they'll be, in, they're already inspired. They just, they're confused thinking, which all of us could fall into is, has let, has led a person into despair. So it's really just clearing away the confused thinking, which will disappear very, very quickly, but it doesn't involve scaring people. It doesn't involve terrifying them. It doesn't involve threatening them that they won't have their jobs or they can't go to school. Whereas people who are coming with mandates, who are coming with demands on other people, they need to find a way to get people to comply. And that's through force, whether it's gentle force in the sense of, you know, more remote, this, uh, do this for everybody, take, a, take one for the team type of uh, pressure, or it's actually threats of losing their livelihood or losing their ability to visit family and so forth, then that's, that's the distinction. If that's, not, that's not coming from love. That's coming from really a form of, of destructive energy, unfortunately. It's packaged as somehow being good for you and if you're going to be good for everyone else. But um, that, that's just the, the packaging language. It not, has nothing to do with what the motivation it is, and it has nothing to do with what the intended consequences are. Because we'll see, and we do see the distinction when we see a person who's lighthearted and joyful and loving, and and even though we're, it's we're crushed and it's unbearable that there's people who are suffering in the world, from a lack of connection to godliness, it we we recognize that that we're still meant to be joyful. We're still meant to be full of joy and hope, and recognize that God's taking care of us, and there's no reason for fear, no reason for fear, and we're not meant to be spreading fear. If if we have a fearful thought, we can keep our mouth shut. Uh, and, but that's not meant, we're not just meant to be spreading the fear. We're meant to be spreading hope and, and awakening humanity to the joyful recognition of God almighty and knowing that God almighty has a good plan in store for humanity, for everybody in all of, all of humanity. God's intention is, as the Babacher Rebbe said, it's not conceivable that God almighty would go to the trouble of creating seven, eight billion human beings to only to see them be God forbid destroyed. That cannot be his intention. His intention is that everyone should thrive, and not only should the eight billion that exist thrive, but then the eight billion should become eighty billion, which we should merit to see in our lifetime, and many more than that. So, God willing, we should experience this all speedily in our times. We should experiencing experience the the revelation of godliness in the world, the rebuilding of the holy temple in Jerusalem, which is a house of prayer for all mankind. And a and and the awareness of and, and and the coming of Mashiach, who will be someone who will be that inspirer, who's going to inspire everyone to that recognition, even the holdouts. Um, and and our job is to to lay the groundwork right now and and do our part to speed that up. And God willing, we should experience it in a full revelation speedily right now. Thank you all. And God bless you all.